Welcome back to Basic Bananas Radio, where we share tried and tested ways to grow your brand and get more customers. Everything from the latest in marketing and branding, right through to growing your team and creating an irresistible culture. Hi, and welcome back to Basic Bananas Radio. I am here today with Nir Savaro, and we're discussing all things brand identity, customer journey, and storytelling. Super excited for this one for you to hear. Let's jump straight in. Nir, so good to see you. Good to see you too. We just came off a two and a bit week journey on a motorcycle through the Himalayas. And I'm still landing. How are you going? I think you and I spoke the day after I landed back home. And I told you I was sitting on my couch at home and I felt as if it was just a dream. I think it was probably the best vacation we ever had. Well, definitely my best vacation ever. There was peace. You know what I mean? Like hours on the motorcycles, beautiful scenery, time to think. It was, I think, in a sense, mind blowing and the best at peace that you can be on a motorcycle. Yeah, I couldn't describe it any better. And, and I feel like because we also got, we got pushed, the roads pushed us, the conditions, every day was new challenges. We had sand, we had lots of river crossings. I got some really cool videos of you. We might include those here in the, on this video. And we kept going. And after nine days of riding, we finally arrived at Umningla, the highest rideable pass. And it's the highest road that we can ride. And on top of there, you did a presentation. So you're probably also, you, you probably got the record for presenting on the highest possible place in the world. I think, so um, I checked, I think I have probably something that is more like um, the highest book pitch ever on a rideable road. Or something like that. We're going to apply. We're going to see. I don't know if you know this, but the, the intention was to do about 10 minutes. And when I do a, a talk for 10 minutes, it's structured. I know exactly what I'm going to say. I couldn't get enough oxygen. And I couldn't remember the next things. And I think it came out about five minutes or a bit less. And then when we finished and people were clapping, Indians that were standing there, strangers, started to come up to me and asking to take a picture. And after they took a picture, they're like, you're famous, right? They had no idea why. I'm, but I'm standing you there are one famous. by one. It's you are I famous. Am. And I think people almost passed out just clapping because of the lack of oxygen. And and you you are amazing at storytelling. And that's something we're going to talk about today a little bit too. And you published a book recently called Fuck the Slides. And I got it here. I've, I'm almost all the way through. I love it. Something we we talked a lot in on this trip about, even though it was a, a you call it a vacation, it was like a crazy adventure. It was hardly a vacation, <laughs> but we talked a lot about marketing, branding, pitching, and we have a lot in common on also in terms of our backgrounds. And every time I had a conversation with you, I walked away thinking about something new. You really made me think, and more importantly, also you made me laugh so much. I, I have never cried so much on a trip in two weeks ever in my entire life. And I love laughing. So thanks for that. Now let's talk a bit about where should we start? Fuck the slides, storytelling. Where do you want to start? Let's go for it. Uh, let's start with the fact that storytelling is the weird buzzword that everybody likes using, but they don't really understand what it means. Now, the way we communicate is a story. When you go home and you tell your spouse how the day went, tell them a story. When you go to the pub and have a pint, tell them a story. When we want to convince someone to buy something, we tell them a story that they need to believe in order to buy my product or my service. All we do all day is tell a story. Now, the funny thing is we are using this thing as if it's a, a, a an automation platform or something like that. In fact, it is the way we communicate. More than that, someone told us it's a soft skill. I believe it's a mistake. It's a must skill. It's something everybody needs to learn and practice. 
And same as you and I were riding motorcycles in India. I've never ridden dirt bikes or stuff. I had to improve. And I'm nowhere to being good. I just did two weeks. And if I do it probably and get some lessons and train and do every you know, six or eight months, I become a lot, a lot better. Most probably I would not win the championship. I'll be very good. I'll be a lot better than what I was earlier. Why? Because the improvement is exponential. Why are people not practicing their storytelling abilities? If you're a small business owner and you're not practicing this, you're basically creating a, the biggest sin in business, in my opinion. Because you spend time on money and product and this and that. And you spend a lot of money on marketing. Why? You can spend much less. I agree. So yeah. my journey now around the world and traveling for the last two years in over 50 places is I believe I can teach people how to become better storytellers. I agree. And I feel like what you're also saying is that storytelling is makes all of your efforts have a high return. It's it for me personally, this is my language. I feel like storytelling is like the fairy dust that we can put onto anything we do, any communication that we do. And from you, I've very much learned to use storytelling even more now. Even anything that I start, whether it's a, a keynote, a presentation, an article, any post that I've been writing since our journey, I usually now start with some sort of a story. So how can a business owner learn this craft? Where should they start? Hmm. Maybe even reviewing what I, they've got. I think my book is a great place, but not just me. Now, I think, first of all, there's a way of how you already do certain things. The way you pitch your business. Okay, that's the easiest way. Go to your website. Now, if I ask you what your business does, most people will start giving or using a lot of buzzwords, and they will use the features to explain what they actually do. But in the book and in every workshop, I ask people, look at your website. What does it say on the top of your website? What do you actually do? And if you can craft something that I can understand, guess what? I'm interested. More than interested, I'm, I need to, I feel a bit compelled to scroll down, to understand how are you going to do what you told me you're going to do. Once these things are structured and you understand them and you can tell them to any person, that means two tests. One is on your website. If people keep scrolling. And the second one is if you tell a stranger in a pub, this is what I do. And we often meet new people. Oh, so what's your profession? Small business owners might use a lot of different words to explain. We opt out. We're not interested. But if you know exactly what you do, I'll say, oh, that's crazy. Interesting. I like it. I want to learn more. How do you do it? What do you mean? Is it an office, a company? Is it a product? Let them ask the question. If they're interested, the sale is in. Now I need to convince them. Right? So one of the key problems that we understand today is we're misusing words to define certain things. As small business owners, we really want to get that sale. We want more clients. We want a higher revenue. The problem is we're trying to fire all of them. We aim with a too wide of a range of everybody could be my client. What if we sat down and defined who is really your client, the ones you want? By the way, have you ever sat down and defined who are not your clients? Most people don't. And once we start doing this, using words, I learn more about who I am, what I want to do, what do I offer, what I don't offer. What would I define as a good client? And the funny thing in business, it's the easiest thing. You need a pen and a paper. It won't cost you any money. So take you an hour. I, I agree. I love. I also love the whole exercise. We we actually do that with with our members too. Is yeah, who who are your clients, but also who are not your clients? Who do you even if you have some of those who are not your clients, you know how can you get rid of them? And have you got some practical? I'd love some practical example here of somebody who has implemented this storytelling. You know, it, what do you call it? Skill, uh, the must have skill into their business and the, sort of the before and after, and then we can dig a little bit deeper into customer journey, branding, messaging, et cetera. I think if we look for a moment at one of the key things we're doing today with companies is identifying what they actually do and separating that from how they do it. So what I actually do needs to be a very simple one-liner that doesn't have buzzwords, okay? So it won't have um, 
technology driven AI learning, machine learning, uh, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean. But we help small business owners increase their revenue. Okay. We want to do increase their revenue and the platform. Could be. Then how do you do it? And we invite people to do what are the three key features that you can use or the, the services you might give. Okay. Now I understand. I want to increase my revenue and this is how you're going to do it. So for example, I offer um, talks, workshops, and, and live code. Okay, as an example. We just did um, an interesting company in the US. They raised $10 million, um, two amazing entrepreneurs. And it's a, a data-oriented company. Now, the way it was structured, the explanation was so complicated that I understand it's something about data. Now, initially, when they sent me the, the company, uh, I thought they collect data a certain way and so on. Starting to work with them, we understand that they help you do something very specific with data. That created, by the way, and I can't, sorry, NDA and, and stuff, but that created the differentiation, okay, with the competition they had until now. So, yes, you might use this platform and this, but we offer this service that will be worth, I don't know, $100,000 a year. And we charge this. If almost every, and startup companies are the best example, the, the early stages sometimes, they just raised a few millions, and it's so complicated, their explanations. They actually are missing the audience that they're targeting because they didn't understand. On top of that, if you look, when you look at that structure, okay, write about 20 words that you like using in your brand. And then write words you don't like. Could be 5, 10, 20. The reason is we start identifying how we behave as a brand, not as the founders or the owners. And that would take us a bit about how do you build a brand character and, and stuff like that. Now, in everything we do today, and, and that's also, and I think we discussed about this a few times during our trip, the idea that we communicate through emotions and not through data is crucial. So here's a tip. Next time you write a piece of content for your audience, by the way, even if you write an email, take a look and if you can print it, Circle every word that is technical, data, buzzword, and underline every time you use an emotion. And you'll see you're very dry. That means that I'm not conveying the right emotion or the emotions I even want. And another tip is before you send anything to any client or do any marketing, read it out loud. I like and see that. if your intonation conveys because your audience will read it in their head out loud. One thing you also said when we had a, a chat about my keynote is how do you want people to feel? So what emotion do you want to feel on stage? But also, and this applies to any marketing piece, but also how do you want them to feel? And I feel like this is such an important question we forget to ask when we write something any piece of content, any, any communication is how do we want them to feel anywhere in that story? I feel like this is so important. Um, I just finished. Uh, um, we're now doing this podcast is, is a good, uh, uh, an Olympic medalist is doing his first new presentation that we've been working on for the last two weeks. He loved starting, but with some jokes. Okay. And he's a big guy. He won two Olympic medals. The problem is when he started with a joke and then needed to jump into a serious thing, the audience doesn't react the same way. Okay? You don't go and watch a movie that's a, a comic movie, right? And then two minutes later, it becomes like the saddest movie ever. You wouldn't go. Now, we need to understand that we're taking people on our journey. When you came into my office, it's a journey. When... The, the, the office is full of uh, uh, toys and dolls and stuff. You go in, you know, why? Because I wanted to feel comfortable. So, for example, when people will come in, and I have, I don't know if you know, these dolls, uh, Funko Pop and all that, we'll put a picture, and people go in and they'll see something. If they like Star Wars or James Bond or anything, they say, ah, I love this. What happens now is amazing. The sale is almost done. They like me, I like them. We have something in common. 
and we talk about the latest James Bond and who's going to replace Daniel Craig. This is a good conversation. I'm enjoying myself. They're enjoying themselves. By the time we sit on the couch and we start chatting, talking about life and other stuff, we're now almost friends because we have something in common. They smiled when they came in. They felt childhood when they came in. Now, the idea of we are going to work together means that I need to understand I can give them the service they want, that I think there's a good connection, that it's worth the whole trouble signing a big client. And on the other hand, they need to be convinced that the feeling they have are connected with the data, my ability to perform, I have the right team, and so on. Starts with the office. Starts with the feeling. I don't know if I give you a card. My card says cheap of happiness. No, I don't think... Say, uh, so I come and visit you in Australia, but the card doesn't say CEO. Nobody cares about the CEO. Everybody's a CEO on LinkedIn. Mine gives you a feeling. Now, the calling card, you, you, can, you have my data. You have my WhatsApp. You have everything you want. Still, when I gave people the card, they smiled. They won't remember my name. Sometimes they won't even remember what I do if they didn't. I just met random people. And sometimes I meet people two years after. They'll be like, hey, chief of happiness. You know, I still have your card. Yeah. My view on cards is that they then actually in Australia, maybe it's different in, in Israel. They're not that necessary. However, if you do have cards, you might as well make an impact like yours is. Now, this leads us to customer journey because you talked about, and I have a few more quick things I want to insert here. Customer journey, you talked about your office, for example, people walk in and they can, some people can connect with the different memorabilia. Is that the right word? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> Pictures, toys, etc. And also the cards obviously are a touch point on the customer journey. Before we get to the customer journey, I wanted to quickly insert two sort of questions, comments in the storytelling bit. One is, what do you think about inserting the person that is reading the information that you're talking to into the story as almost like a character? So, for example, so putting them into the story and and having them try on the metaphorical shoes. So, for example, somebody says, hey, what do you do near? And you say, do you, so Francisca, do you know someone who? Do you know someone who runs a business and would like to attract more funding? So you put me in that story and I will then say, I, I do. And then you say, well, I help these businesses to attract more funding through blah, blah, blah. Do, do you love that technique? Because I personally think it's a really good technique. So um, there's two options. Yes and no, right? <laughs> yes, because people like to feel important. No, because what I did is I, I told you you're a Important. Do you know someone? I, I made you the, the the main character for a second, and then I told you, great. Can you connect me to them? No, what no, no. Exactly. No, no, no. It's not about connecting them. It's more about explaining what you do by saying. So let's say instead of saying, "Hey, near what you do," and you say, "Oh, I do this and this and this," you say, "So do you know someone who has a business?" So what I do is I help these people with blah blah blah. Do, does that make sense? Great. So I help people be more successful in their business by doing one, two, three, for example, okay? And the reason is most people don't understand what we mean when we say we drove through India, right? But when I told people I drove on a motorcycle through hail, snow, rain, dirt, this, they understand. When I tell you I own a bar in Tel Aviv, you now are imagining a bar. It doesn't necessarily mean you imagine my bar. Never been. Every person listening now is like, oh, this is what they imagine. So there's a difference between me being able to control what you're going to see and then me asking you to be a part of it. And the reason why I said yes and no is because we try it. And maybe in a different um, culture, maybe in a different way, maybe when you present it a bit differently. And I think one of the worst things we have is this tendency to listen to people like you and I and do exactly what we're doing. And I'm saying, no, there's a lot of ways to tell a story. Find a way that is right for you. So as you said, I like this. It means it works. You know? Now maybe I'll try it tomorrow and say, wow, this is my blow. So I think it's important for the listeners and the viewers. There are a million different ways. 
but it's about crafting until you find what is good for you. I agree. Okay? Yeah. So customer journey. Mm. Yeah. I think the most undervalued fix in your business today. So if people are coming through your website, if you can fix one thing, what will it be? And then they send an email, right? They submit and you send them what? A thank you email, nobody cares. What are you going to tell me? What's the first contact I'm going to have with you that I will remember you and like you? Um, emails. You and I have been going back and forth for this podcast on emails, right? And you have a signature, right? And I have a signature. And everybody, if you don't have a signature, this is your chance. Promote something, okay? So in my agency in previous years before COVID even, every month employees were allowed to write or pick one article. And that would be their signature for the month. And everybody had their own thing. So some people would pick one and some people would write one. Um, create that journey. Every point of contact, by the way, before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting, we create a funnel for everything. And you don't necessarily need to invest at the moment a lot of money. You're going to talk to them anyway. Great. What are you going to tell them? You're going to send them an email. Great. Craft it. We just finished a client, um, a big law firm in the US. I think the customer journey file we have 27 pages of a structure. And it started by, hey, so how do clients call you? Okay, email, events. Great. Then what happens? Great. And we structured everything. So let's say you can put three, four, five contact points and improve them. Now, a key thing is to do a bit better than yesterday. So write a good email, read it out loud to yourself, make sure it conveys the emotion. But more than that, every paragraph has a, a key message. What do you want me to understand? Why are you the right person to hire the company? What is it going to give me on the other side? What's the trust that you're going to create? Now, if you look at it, 99% of people never looked at their email and said, hmm, where am I creating trust? No one. But it's so simple. How does, so, yeah. Sorry, sorry. How does storytelling and brand identity intersect with the customer journey? So, I've written two novels. I love writing. There's love story. When I write a book, the main character and some of the other characters are what we call a round character. They have depth. They're not there just to serve the plot, but they have purpose, right, of why they do certain things. If I ask your brand, 99% of brands do not have that. By the way, that's the new next book is, is the business catcher. Why we're building brands at all. So, in that book, I will have a five, about 15 pages, for example, and I know everything about that brand. How they got this car, what happened in the fifth grade, what they think about their parents, what they like or don't like, the cat they had, and so on. Everything. Why? Because that creates consistency. At a certain point in the plot, I do not decide anymore. Sometimes I'm not happy about it, but the main character needs to decide. If not, lack of consistency. If your brand is not a well-rounded character, it means that you will make a decision. For example, if you and I start a company tomorrow, in some cases, I will be, trust me, I know about this. Okay. And then other times we say it's the Australian market. You know more than me, so you make the decision. Long-term, you're creating inconsistency until the brand collapses. And that's what happened to most companies, by the way, most of them, the crisis. And you know the friends who are chill and the friends who panic. How does your brand behave? And I also feel like, uh, you know, on top of that, when you have this clarity on who exactly is this brand as a character, as you as you describe it, you can then look at these touch points, let's say the email signature. And I'm a big fan of leveraging email signatures, not just to pitch, but also to convey this character. So you can then say, okay, let's say my brand is is playful or intelligent or super innovative. How can I put this character through these touch points? So how can I make my email signature slightly more playful? Yeah, 
So small business owners are the easiest uh, example. We will have professional as a core value, right? Now, if you ever heard of a company who says, we are not professional as a core value. No, you've never. So when we say playful, what does it mean? For many, many years, uh, we had this, before we even had a written like structure for the core values. And I was a small business owner. I had a few employees. We have an agency and wanted to scale. But I didn't want to scale the agency as 30, 50, 100. My agency was always supposed to have a means to an end to bring me here. So the core value, the first one was be a little bit of an entrepreneur, which meant that people were allowed to come in, say, hey, I have an idea. We tested a lot of the ideas. Most of them didn't work. In some cases, I put my, my own money. They'll work. But in some cases, it also meant that if they have an idea and I cannot support it, what's not in the best interest of the company, they left. By the way, the first employee I had in the company today has a business this year that's going to be much bigger than mine. And I love it. But when he wanted to do something, I couldn't accommodate. It. And, and uh, I was sad and we were trying and we figured we would fight like a married couple. And I went to Dublin for a mentorship event to learn how to communicate better because I didn't want to lose them and everything. But that was where our story ended, this chapter. It started a new story. By the way, we meet every two or three months for lunch and talk about work and business. We still think about doing stuff together. But be a little bit of an entrepreneur meant I had to let it go. What is something that we haven't shared yet now coming towards the end of this, this episode? Is there anything else that you would love to share with our listeners? Yes. If you're hiring an external marketing, CMO, PPC, campaign manager, whatever you're hiring, please understand that the most important thing is if you can give them that book that says, this is who we are, this is what we believe in, this is what we don't like. These are the words we use or don't use. And the reason is because you are asking a complete stranger to wear that character and act like that character. If you didn't give them enough information, either you order their hand and go through the process and make sure you write it or document it, or try and bring them a bit more meat on the bone to be able to work and succeed. Don't tell them this is good or not good. We, we don't know what to do with these details. Explain what you like or don't like. And this is the way you craft the brand, and this is the way you find a good person to work with, long-term and success. If done correctly, by the way, your marketing budget will be concise. It will cost you less to get further. And this is one of the key things we teach today. Yeah. And also, you know, having that brand book, we, we have a, a brand map that our members create, which includes exactly all that. And having that also is super useful with AI. Now you need, you need that whether you hire a person or you're using AI, ChatGPT or which, you know, any of the channels, you need exactly what you're talking about so that the person or the, the machine can do a great job for your brand. So yeah. super, okay. super grateful that you shared that. Where one, can thing people... about, uh, one thing about AI is make sure that when you go, before you submit it, still make sure that the emotions conveyed are the ones you want or you have. Okay? Because sometimes like, like, like giving it to someone else to write, it could be a great article, doesn't necessarily mean it conveys your feeling or emotions. So that is also important. That's a really good point. Where can people connect with you, find you? I'll put a link in the show notes for your book also. How would you like to connect? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is the easiest, even though everybody's happy, happy on the platform too much sometimes, which is funny, right? Um, it feels today like everybody's happy on LinkedIn. It's an interesting concept. Um, I'm writing about it, uh, a lot of things today in the last few weeks. Um, and I'm kickstarting my YouTube channel again. And part of what I want to do is feel free to ask me anything you want. It's a good question that can serve people. I'll record a video for you with an answer. That's really cool. I'll post a link for both. So LinkedIn, where everyone is happy, happy, and YouTube, where everyone is sad. <laughs> everyone is all Everybody's happy. real. Or more people are real, I think, today on YouTube. On YouTube? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You I find LinkedIn is actually... Struggle. Instagram, everyone is super happy too, but that's a whole other conversation. So we'll pop the links for both there. And also if anyone wants to submit a question, I'm going to submit a question just to see if Nir really holds up to his promise here on sure. YouTube. 
and follow it near also on youtube and linkedin and the book buy the book it's a really good book so thanks again thanks near for tuning in and thanks everyone else for listening and being here i hope you loved this show we loved recording it if you did love it feel free to share it with a friend or two and i can't wait to see you again next time see you soon to get more from Basic Bananas and to learn new ways to grow your business with clever marketing, visit basicbananas.com.